Recording. Okay, so day two of aquaponics greenhouse workshop. Some review of yesterday. So how, how did it go yesterday? Comments and feedback. We got a lot of the structure out of treated lumber two by sixes, two by eights. We got the roof sections, so all of the roof sections and all the walls, right? Do we leave one without a middle line? Yeah. For a Maybe. door? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh any comments about yesterday? About workflow and yeah, took us. It was a little more disorganized than I expected. I think, it, I think it ended up working out pretty well, but uh, I think that you know people were scrambling to figure out what they needed to, uh, what they needed to do. Um, I think it still ended up uh, being people who just did mostly cutting, which I think is good. Um, but I think there was like uh, less of uh, organization as to who does what and how many people need. Yeah. How many have left right now? I was put on doing wall modules, but I basically decided to mark and cut and and count through all of them because that mm -hmm. slot was missing so we didn't go with the original work teams but yeah it's kind of been like this every time Just like we, we don't we could spend an extra 10 minutes beforehand like doing all the posted notes or whatever uh and i also think it should be better like it makes it a whole lot easier mm -hmm. how do we do that uh yeah i mean it should be in principle quite easy like okay we post up all the notes everyone puts up their name on it um, could that work or w so what what broke down in that process I, I think that uh, we can we can improve it according to the skills everybody like which everybody has so I think one of the <coughs> like the, the important issue that Hampus got into the this uh, leadership role was to count the cuts the amount of modules yeah. The amount of pieces that, that we needed to, to finish the project, and nobody did it. Nobody was there to do it. So Hampus, instead of doing modules, uh, had to get into that role, and I think that's part of it. Yeah. Like uh, I think there's. Um, and I think ev all of them were cut and measured, or measured like it maybe took one and a half hours or something, and then they're all all the boards were done. Yeah. It, what complicates is that we don't have defined leading roles, and I don't I don't necessarily want to tell people what to do, but it's needed mm -hmm. in some sense. But then when you have that, how do the rest of the people know what the idea of that plan is? Mm -hmm. And, and so what we could have done better is just like for every board and stack them together, like all the 69s in one spot and would be easy to count or whatever. But the other thing it's I, pretty I, smooth. I think it's important is the quality control. Like yeah. Nobody's doing it. Everybody's doing their own module, but nobody's uh, really Checking if the models mm -hmm. are right, mm -hmm. so yeah. I think that's that's another not another issue that we could yeah I think we yeah. work on it. I think that's someone everybody that's something everybody should do. Like if you're building a module, oh this 48 kind of looks long, and then measure those before you screw it in. Yeah, for sure, for sure. But oh, well, there's people that <coughs> are coming for the first time doing like first day. Yeah. So I think it's still important to kind of uh, get them. Uh, allocated correctly. Yeah. Keep them. Uh, but it's, it's been our style to just jump right in yeah. all the time. You know, it, it's drawbacks, but it's also a little bit of a proof of concept. <coughs> like it's constraint design and whatnot. But. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would say that you know, being, being my first day yesterday, admittedly, you know, I was dealing with a lot of different things, just trying to get you know, actually meet people, understand you know how the dynamic is in the group, and uh, I didn't. I didn't have a good understanding of who was doing what necessarily, like what was on the board, just not being able to see it visually. Um, so I went out there with the attitude of, you know, I have a general idea of what needs to be done in terms of what we discussed. Um, and once we were out there, I did expect that you were going to be there with us. However, um, in retrospect, and I shared that with the team, like I think it was good that you weren't there, at least for me, because I felt like it gave me an opportunity to really connect with, with people more. Um, and we really had to rely on each other to, you know, deal with some of the things that people just talked about. And while it wasn't necessarily systemic in terms of quality control and workflow management, stuff like that, um, you know, different people stepped out at different times to make sure that we were 
you know, double checking people's work, measuring stuff, you know, going back to do something else that needs to be re you know, reworked. Um, and so, all things considered, for me, you know, I I enjoyed yesterday. Um, you know, and um, and I appreciate you know everybody's support. Um, just getting in that. Um, but yeah, I can see you know for some people if they're not you know a, a go getter you know or a doer or whatever you know you might be on the sidelines waiting for someone to tell you what to do and, and not get to do anything you know. But the big thing for me was like I didn't get to cut. I, I you know I, I cut chop wood you know to carry wood or whatever. <laughs> so I wasn't really stressing you know oh I need to learn how to do that. I haven't, I haven't drilled something and put wood together in a long time, and it felt good to just, you know, have that experience again. So anyway, um, thank you. Yeah. Other feedback from yesterday? Oh, I have this uh, corrected two of our modules. Thank you. Did I? Yeah. We came in and said, oh, they're not even, so you put oh, the yeah, yeah. screws out and put them back in more evenly. I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, well you guys were working pretty quick, so I just had to unstick two screws and, and bend the board a little bit. We'll see, we'll see I think we could it kept a pretty good pace. I think, I think consider like to make that better is to be even more uh, ingrained with like you do this, I do that. But we were pretty quick. Well, I just think that it definitely needs two people because sometimes when the board is not straight, you need one power to pull it straight while the other power pushes the screw. Yeah. That worked well for me. I had to ask the mother to couple of times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To make that happen. Okay. All right. That's it. <laughs> I'm cracking down. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, we'll focus more on working in as teams. Like for example, right? I was taking off the getting the ply, the getting the glazing over. So that took me all that time. We can uh, we can pretty much carry over the rest of that. Let's let's actually do that together. Maybe. Um, comments on single person stuff like how do you work how do you work crooked wood still don't think um, depends where you are but on a simple modulus I still don't see that two people are needed if it's even bent out of shape like crazy because what you do is one step at a time so you can only do two pieces you can only do one connection at a time if you're a single person so you do that so what if it's like crooked like that the next corner you get to well, you'll connect it too, and maybe like like this still. Well, keep doing a third one. By the time you get to the fourth one, they have to come together. And maybe at that point you might need need a hand, but you can definitely get so even so that's the last corner. It wants to be like this. Okay, by gravity you force it down. It may still be like this. What do you do then? Well, still you don't need a second person. Screw in the place where it's actually aligned. Once you have that, you have a cons uh, you have another degree of freedom removed, and then you can do that. And if you can't hold it there, then maybe you need a person, but perhaps you can use a use a some kind of a clamp or something. So uh, my history on this has been most of, like most of the time here, I'm working alone uh, outside of workshops. So, and you can also learn like there's also books on this. How do you do construction by yourself? Uh, so there, you know, there's, you just have to review the problem from a different angle and see how you can do it. So that's, that's something. But now if we have more people, yeah, you can definitely get more people. I still think it would be quite interesting to see, to have a team of one person, two people, three people, and four people do a module and see who, who actually does, does the best. And I think we'll actually be surprised as far as um, how that works. If we actually, you know, we have a contest, it's like, yeah, 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 we're, we're like competing and so you have to think you have to think okay how do i how do i really do it fast and that point you start getting creative on how you can do it so definitely something to think about um beyond that pretty cool i mean i that's good that the things w went up uh, at least as far as uh, the frames being screwed together uh we can put them up and w what we want to do is on the pad clear out the area behind the house and we can um start doing that we've got all the so we have to bring the rest of the glazing over. Some of it is kind of dirty, so we just washed washed off a bunch of that yesterday. Uh, today we can do a little more of that as far as uh, getting the dirt off, uh, just kind of cleaning the panels off a little bit, at least uh, spray it with water and get the get any dirt off. It's not it's not too bad. Uh, so with that, we can put on the glazing. How do you do that? You don't want to screw the glazing directly in. You want to screw through batten strips. So uh, actually to wrap up 
Uh, let's go to like page four. Like after here, how do you do the glazing? So we talked about we did the struct. You know, we've got the main pieces of the structure. Um, what about oh. so structure count? Um, how about glazing? How do you do it? So r right now, let, let's draw one. So let's take for example the long one. So we can do a long one and a short one. Well, actually, let's 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 think about how all of them work. So this is say eight. That let's call that the eight. Let's call that the six. Um, and then. More like the 16, uh, 16 here. There's <clears throat> there's provision for apertures at the very top of the 16, so there would be, if you put on the the glazing on it, you, it'll reach only up to here. What we want to do there is put a a support like an edge support. So actually do a piece of two by six or two by four, we, we have two by fours that are treated. We can put a piece of two by four that spans up there, but that this is this piece is actually, draw, draw this more accurately. So you've got the long one here, down the middle. Therefore, this that's good for structure. So you're supporting both on the very ends when you lay the one end and the other end on the wall. That is good. Uh, but that means the window you have to do in two pieces, the window support, you'd have to do that in two pieces. So here's here's one piece that fits in there and another piece that fits in there as well. And then you, you can attach the 14 foot glazing to it. Um, that's, that's how it would work. Uh, I would say we've got two by fours treated sitting in a pile we've got a bunch of that so i would say do some two by fours they don't need they don't need much structure there that's just to support the window um so two by four lumber treated should treated be, is what would go there should be 21 and three quarters each piece i think 21 and three quarters um so how do you get that you get 48 Minus four and a half, four point five divided, by, divided two. by two. Yeah. Four forty two point five divided by two. So twenty one and a quarter, do we say? Uh, 20, yeah, 21 and 3 quarters. 3 quarters. Really? Yeah. Okay. 43 and a half divided by 2. 43.5, okay. <coughs> so that, that's what those are. Uh, how do you do the glazing? How do you attach it? So there's long batten strips. Let's actually expand this a little bit here. What are these batten strips? They're one by twos. They're actually cedar. So it also um, took some of that from the greenhouse. We've got some more in storage. But uh, how do they look? They're just long strips, long thin strips. So you want to screw through them as opposed to directly into the glazing because the glazing you might just puncture through and break through it. So it's convenient to do do a batten on the end, a one by two so that the force of the screw is distributed. You can do that like every every two feet or so, every yeah, every foot or two feet, um, like 18 inches or so. So you've got these battens. All the way all the way to then to pinch down the hole. Well, here you you're going, you're ending up there because you've got the one piece. Uh, the second piece 
we can put it in, in an interim. We can also make that openable. So to make it openable, we can uh, rework that a little bit. So there's, we don't have to do that right now. Let's get the structure up. Do we need to so put a, a big, a, a big one, or can we just put small ones? No, you can put small ones. It's just to hold it. Uh, we're not going to have those long ones anyway, like that. That long, they come only in a certain length. So get a num number of those batten strips. There, yeah, they're. How to are be these more accurate. Where are they screwed in? To the side of the wall module? No, right through the glazing on the edge. So the glazing is okay. four feet. So you're just pinching you it down. You still go through the glazing, but you yeah. get, get that as well. Uh -huh. Yeah, you distribute the force on that. So for accuracy, these things are actually, yeah, as Christian pointed out, they're, they're shorter. They're a bunch of, there may be a few pieces. It doesn't matter how short they are. Just use, use what we've got. So you can make that into multiple pieces, however, mm -hmm. however it's convenient. And uh -huh. how fragile is the glazing? Because it's probably a good idea to not sink that screw too far, I guess. You're not sinking that screw into the... You're distributing that force through the batten. Now, as far as the batten, don't go deep into the batten. Just end up flush with the surface of the yeah. batten. That's yeah. all. Yeah, so you might have a short one here. Uh, do a little longer to the end. And then do a separate one for the top piece here so that we can rework uh, we can make these openable uh, we don't need to do that right now but we're making a provision to make this openable by battening this up here in the meantime also you'd have to batten it up across here because there's nothing really supporting that edge um, there's the back so what's the detail behind there the 2x4 that's behind there I would put it on edge, uh, not on edge, but but on a flat side behind this, so you have ample room to screw in. Um, so this one should actually, yeah. So that's the two by four laying flat, face face on, and this one would be like this, as well. Um, but I would say worry about the main bulk of the glazing. If we get the long piece of glazing on and. Like let's uh, let's actually move on the structure so we can do the structure and then get right to the pond. Like if the structure is standing, it's still relatively easy to access everything, so we can finish those details as well. But let's let's move on in, a, in terms of schedule. So just to review the schedule, we've got five days. So yesterday, the structure we want to get to the ponds and finish them today, so we can actually start filling them. So we actually can inject our fish in there. Um, the, the in two days, so biological systems in two days. Mm -hmm. So tomor tomorrow we'd be building all the mm -hmm. other ancillary structures like beds, towers, everything, all the supporting medium for, for life. Mm -hmm. And then we can populate it actually seeded with the life on the, the next seeds? day after. Yeah, yeah, we've got all the seeds we mentioned yesterday, we've got those. Um, and then there's automation day where we talk about, okay, we seeded that just by hand, get them going. And then we talk about, here's how you automate th all the watering. And with that, we, we got a lot of shark bite fittings and PEX fittings so that you can make quick connects and, and wire that, that up to actually to the universal controller, the 3D printer, it's, it's the universal thing. So we can turn those things on. We basically have one panel with electronics, which is dry, and then behind it or elsewhere, You've got all the hydraulics, which are simple washer valves. Washer valves are the cheapest way you could do it. You can also go to go to Adafruit Industries. They have like DC solenoids, but the cheapest thing you can get for two channels is a is a washer solenoid, which costs like six bucks for for two channels. So like three, it costs you three dollars to turn on a water water channel uh, automatically. So it's like that's the dirt cheapest you can do it. Do so those have uh, guard circuits when the Magnetic field collapses. Do you know with like normal solenoids, like do you just let it? Right. Yeah, it's gonna come back. When you run that through a solid state relay, which is what we're gonna do, that that issue goes away because that has that protection built in. Okay. So we're we're good on that. If we did a transistor by itself, you do have that flyback thing happening. From the, the solenoid is a mechanical thing that it's a mechanical thing that once it snaps back, it causes electricity a spike in electricity. So you got to protect that. And we did that on a early CEB controllers where we used transistors to do that and there you had to protect that, that back, back, back voltage 
but with a, like off the shelf solenoids such as whether solid solenoids or well more like the relays like there's you can get the dedicated relays like we have on the 3d printer controller we can use that or you can have these other boards with solid state relays Th those those you don't need to do that and it depends uh, depends how you wire it. depends how you're wiring it but in the system how we're wiring, wiring it that that issue does not arise uh, for now so that's that's kind of the the plan the five kingdoms fungus um, animalia that's the fish is there a kingdom of worms insects is that like still animals I'm not sure but well, there's plants microbes what else it might be what's the fifth one the fifth one I said fungi Let's see if we were represented five king five kingdoms, what do they say? On the Lord. Minerals. So we've got uh Which ones? We've got you say mineral kingdom already? Process. Did you say mineral? <coughs> One more row. So protists. Yeah, so oh yeah, so protists. And then so there's fungi, plants, animals, protists, and prokaryotes, which are bacteria. Mm -hmm. So tiny little Both critters. Kind of so protists are. Algae, slime molds, <laughs> and malaria. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got. <coughs> we're going to have <laughs> algae growing in there. Now, the algae. That seeds by itself, and that's food. Like if you have tilapia or these other fish, if they're vegetarian, is trout vegetarian, or is trout omnivorous? Ken, do you know? Uh, tilapia are omnivorous. They eat plants. They eat other critters. Trout are omnivorous. We eat they're probably yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I'm assuming they filter some algae too. But but basically the fish, like if you have fish in there, the pond becomes clear because they eat up filter out the algae and they eat them so that's their food too so fungus we definitely have it intentionally with the fungus towers plants yeah that's the core and animals is the core which is I mean I guess vertebrates and invertebrates so most of it is animals like I think that's the, where the insects worms fish and other critters go into um, but that's that's that so on the ponds yeah so we want to get to them get to the ponds as far as we can um, but <clears throat> wrapping up this design here batten strips but that's yes batten strips to just put on the, the glazing the minimum viable product there is just do the bottom just leave the top little two foot piece open if, if we want to um, oh yeah what's for yeah what's the width of uh, this, this panel like how far sh down should this 2 by 4 be Mm. Two feet, two, two feet, feet exactly, okay. oh, uh, okay. and that's determined once again. That's self-determined by materials yep. constraints. You'll see how far the the glazing reaches, and that that'll be your marker. That's the safest bet because you can mismeasure or whatever. Uh, so do that by the the size of the glazing. Um, okay. So we can say, let's put the glazing in blue here, so the glazing goes. That's kind of a glazing there. I'm not really drawing that accurately. Transparent, and this one would be blue. So, yeah, it's the glazing is going to determine it for you. Uh, just like on the other pieces, on the eight-foot pieces, there is a couple of eight-foot pieces of glazing. Uh, most of it is six. Uh, so for the six, you yeah that, that's covered completely. For the eight one, you can do either full eight or six and two if it's an opening thing. Um, but because we the eight is the back walls, we should keep that all closed because we already um, we're planning on putting the the opening in the top, actually in the top, uh, for airflow. Um, and then there's two foot pieces. So so that now, what do we do for for mounting this on a on a platform? Let's do 
put it directly on it it's already treated if we bond them together if the platform's not particularly even shim just shim it like make them stand together so they become stiff and that way it will look kind of like rise and fall as a unit so wherever it rises or falls just put little shims put spacers underneath there just at to the get base. it even at the at the bottom yeah. yeah on the top we actually if you talk about the six foot panels we've got six feet of waste from each panel just <laughs> use those little strips as the top plate you make sure you bond the two panels together then put the next one and next one it, it's gonna work uh, still because from each one each panel you've got three cutoffs right from from each six each six yeah you got six feet of waste let's use that that's a perfect uh, use case for doing a top plate out of it right yeah. so but we're not doing a sill plate no yeah I mean we could but let's just get the thing up yep so since we got a, a a flat pad already I mean that's it's not that that important if you, if we were like on plain dirt they'll be all like uneven so but here we already got the concrete so we can just go right on that um, yeah so that's that's basically it how do you mount the top panel to the so let's say this is the top panel how do you mount it on the two walls so you got one wall here one wall back there so this is going to be a little slanted well you can ride only on top on top of that but how are you attaching it there is the question well you have a top plate we do have six inch screws we can go straight through so there's um, if you open up that detail here this detail um, What's it look like there? Well, screw from the bottom. Yeah, screw just screw it in from the bottom into the end. So you've got if we zoom that up, so that's the end piece, two by eight of the top. That's the top panel. There. So you got basically. Let's zoom in on that. So you got this, if we could align it. Um, then you've got the the 2x6 panel here. You've got the top plate. Oh, you actually got another one, right? So that's 3 inches right there. So you can screw a screw from the bottom if that screw is longer than 3 inches so it would be your screw goes in like this use your six inch screws like that that would be the easiest way to do it from below, from below. you've got access here that's that's a panel that's got empty inside it's the glazing is on the front but this is convenient to do it like this into the the end piece there and what about the back? The back is similar. <clears throat> it's pretty much identical to that. Right, we'd also do the screw. So now, yeah, you got this little tiny gap. The tiny gap's gonna be like no more than a quarter inch. But you screw that in like that at the back. And that's that's solid, you know each screw has quite a bit of force so uh, comment on forces uh, so this greenhouse so I was dismounting the I was taking four pieces of 14 foot off the old greenhouse and I noticed that on the battens we had so we had three inch deck screws a lot of them were plain broken right through it's like wow how do you get that so what do you think let's think about this what what do you think did that so these are uh, 300 
pound braking strength. It's at least 300 pounds of shear force. And you've got one by two battens screwing into the panel. And like half of those were broken off. Like they sheared in half. How? Humidity? They're rust proof. They're, it's not the elements as far as corrosion. And, and it's not even that you have a, a greenhouse there. It was, it was the top just holding the just holding the polycarbonate. Uh -huh, that's it. They even, they even have even the, 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 the vertical, vertical. Well, it's on the edge. It's into the frame of the the mm -hmm. two by eight. Yeah, it's weird. So it was into the two by eight. That's weird, but that tells me. So I would say that's you've got a four by themselves. No, I I would say I would say there is a clear culprit, and that is you've got a sixteen by four surface of polycarbonate. That's a big sail. That could probably gather up a lot of forces if you have heavy winds, and so it just like flap. That's that's what I think because it's not like the polycarbonate is just it's actually screwed down. Oh yes, I didn't mention one detail. It's screwed down with uh, pole barn screws down the middle as well, because the middle would otherwise flap. So we're screwing that down a little bit here. Uh, so there's a bunch of pole barn screws. Those are little screws that have a little washer on them, so that they they distribute the force. So no batten on there. We just use these <coughs> screws with washers. They're called pole barn screws. So do like every two feet or so. No, like we actually did more like only like five through the whole thing. And um, those panels you took from the roof, they already have those holes. Do they? they already have those holes, so just use use the pattern that was there already. Go through the same holes so you're not puncturing more. Yeah. We did something like that. But so the ones on these edges were, sh were shorn. I think it's like the whole area, you got heavy winds and the thing just vibrates and that somehow breaks the screws. I mean, these were... The screws weren't corroded. I mean, you'll see some of them in the, actually in the battens, just a bunch of them broken. So that's that was quite interesting. But I guess kind of have to think about like all the forces that that do exist. The wind could definitely explain that. I mean, if you get a heavy wind, um, and the polycarbonate does not break, that stuff is strong. So and, um, if you put the towers on top of it, like uh, there's more weight, so it will break easier, right? Well, that doesn't affect, like, that doesn't put any force on the screw, though. The screw is just, you know, three inches into the the edge pieces of the, the roof roof members. Um, I don't think the towers, the towers would weigh down the actual truss structure, um, but that's engineered, that can hold quite a bit, probably, like, I think that's what, like, is that kind of roof, Katarina, what is it, is it like 20 pounds per square foot? I mean, 20 pounds per square foot over 16 times 4, over 64, that's a, over a 1,000 pounds per panel that you can hold. That's a lot. That's a lot. So, and where will uh, the tower be in the mid yeah. middle stuff? Yeah, so uh, I would do the, you, you can, it's structural, so we can, but first of all, we're hanging a, a strip hanging a 2x6 off the roof, uh, attaching it to the roof and holding the weight off of that mm -hmm. wherever the pond is. So it will do like two rows of towers. Um, would, uh, would it make sense to use like hex bolts instead to uh, bolt down the uh, uh, polycarbonate? No, it's like way over overkill I would say. Um, but the point is like whatever schedule we did on that we should probably like double it like in real life now that that greenhouse has been up there since for five years so um i mean that's not a lo long time but it just says that yeah we we better do like six inches for the screws on the edges and that's actually the in a lot of places that's the code thing if you're talking about heavy winds so uh, and we did probably like more like t 12 inches or 18 inches in some places as you'll see so yeah just make sure that's that's like a real data point of okay yeah you need to keep to those schedules because those forces even though you think there's nothing there they can add up like heavy winds so uh, just a little structural lesson on if you design if you build this kind of a greenhouse structure which is like 
if you want to build a weight supporting ceiling I mean this is pretty much you'll probably degenerate to something that looks like this so if you do build this you have good insight on you know what works and what doesn't uh, you can build on our experience and go from there so any questions regarding glazing Step one on that, let's go over to the other house, let's pick out, let's get all the, the glazing in the back of the pickup and bring it over. Um, so, yeah. Next, let's talk about the pond. So what do we do for the simplest pond that uh, gets us enough, enough volume to support a good system? Um, pond. First of all, pond types. What can you do for a pond? Let's go through a little list. Are you going to use the wood structure? Yeah. So you can, so one, what <coughs> we're going to do is frame up wood. Frame up wood. Um, how else? A little tub. So like what we did for the first ever aquaponics, we did, uh, to go back to the pictures, uh, we did tubs for the, the raft system on lettuce. Um, so that's our pond. That's that's the that's <coughs> let's call this. So this is your in-ground pond. So copy that. Copy image. So you can have in-ground. What's the advantage? So let's let's we did this. So in-ground. So what's the advantages and disadvantages of this? More vertical space. You need, but you need to dig. Yeah. And it's colder. It's colder, yeah. More opportunity for it to collapse with the uh, pressure from surrounding. Is it fair to really describe it's it as not done right, collapse. <clears throat> is it fair to really describe it as colder or just more of like that the, the temperature is equalized? It is equalized, so you can say it's actually an advantage or disadvantage. For tilapia, it's actually a disadvantage, but for other fish, you'll keep it like around, uh, you're going to be getting that 60 from the four feet down uh, throughout the year. But of course, if it's too cold in that greenhouse, you know you'll you'll get it yeah, to freeze. In, in but climate, in a tropical climate, it would be, be great. To, to dig it. Probably because it'll be that a little it'll warmer cold, there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, definite heavy work. You, you're talking about backhoe work mm -hmm. if you're going to do this at any kind of size. Yeah. Like we had 3,000 gallons right there. Yeah, I mean that that would be a very long job trying to dig that by hand. Uh, so use a backhoe. So equipment, equipment needs um, backhoe. So excavator. What do you say is needed? Depth? If you were to make it out of wood, what's the maximum depth at which it's still structurally sound? I would say any any amount, as long as you have that wood and it being attached into the soil. Like you can use spikes, like we did, you know, two foot spikes to attach through, but they would have to be uh, can be metal because metal would degrade over time so it has to be either galvanized or stainless or they have they also have uh, fiberglass rebars the rebars are quite convenient for a lot of different purposes yeah um, we use and those rebars they're gonna last like probably like 10 years uh, in the ground like that so I think you can go quite deep like yeah and it depends what layers you have <coughs> underneath. If you have rock, the answer is as far as you got rock, you don't need any support. <laughs> so if you're digging in, if you have uh, sand, well, that you definitely need to support. I mean, there's when we were digging there, some, there were some layers of sand there that you could see they just kind of collapsed too. So you got non-uniform, non-uniform. You got some rock, some some sand, some clay areas, and we saw a lot of these strata, like in the first, this greenhouse actually saw a lot of that. Um, okay, so frame up wood. So that's going up, that's easy, easy. Um, but edges tend to blow out if you go too high. I mean, you just got significant force of the water. If it's a round thing, then that's fine. If it's a long square thing in the middle, you're gonna have to support it. 
like we should probably support this one if we make it like 10 feet um, so like three feet three feet tall just two by twelves two or three layers of two by twelves two or three feet is fine um, you need um, well from the side it should be a square right if you were best material use from best material use, you want it to be a square. From best space use, you don't want it to be a square because you gotta get around to it, you gotta get into the middle. Okay. So there's different considerations for how, what, whatever your criterion is, but in a long greenhouse, you want a long pond to use the space the best. Well, why not two smaller squares? They'll add up on materials. The advantage would be their independence. So if you kill one, you don't kill the other, hopefully. <laughs> and. No, that's a good resiliency like, thing, like you, here. Can you separate the young fish from the big fish in this yeah. way? Does that work? Okay. That's another way to do it. And here, why, why we had the fish forever there is because when one... I, I mentioned how the chloramine killed all the fish. Well, we just seeded, took like a fish from there and put it into the other one. Before that, before long, you had a whole population of hundreds in there. So, so that's a good, good thing for resiliency to have multiple units that are separable. Um, so it's easy... Um, probably, yeah, I mean, that's like easiest way to go. And then what's an even easier way to go? Ken, what did you do in Indonesia? Um, for ponds? Yeah. Uh, well, the first one was uh, totes, IBC totes. Okay, so there's IBC totes. That's a good, ready, you know, $75, you know, $50 and up. Um, the 250 gallon okay. containers uh, $50 and up great 250 gallons that's a cheap way to go I used to have five gallon buckets they worked out pretty good but I was doing a little bit about a different hydroponic system there's five gallon bu buckets for small systems did you, did you have fish? I didn't do fish yeah so <coughs> but I think if you had like I do one, one fish two, two fish in there you could just have them swim between it depending on the size yeah Aquarium. <laughs> Let's make it fancy. Uh, Ken? And then uh, for the other one, uh, we used uh, bamboo, that into the ground, and uh, tarp in it. Plastic. Tarp. Bamboo and tarp. Ken's got the lowest cost option there. So, so the bamboo was just like a structural enforcement to hold the tarp in place? Yeah. Oh, that's On the inside or outside? Outside. The outside. Yeah. I'll paste a picture if you can can in there. Um, and uh, I mean, we've never done this, but, but how about how about a hillbilly pool? Uh, straw bales and tarp. Straw bales and tarp work too, uh, but the straw bales are going to degrade after a few years. Also great for a giant beer. Yeah. If you have like fifty kegs. Yeah, multi-purpose modularity. Straw bales plus tarp, and and I mean, look at these straw bales plus. You can Google that and actually, I mean, it's a good way to go. Bales are solid, they're high enough. Straw, bale. Oh, you can grow mushrooms in them. Cool. I mean, look at that. It's you sit and you, ha you, you munch on the mushrooms. You mushroom can do that. And from the side. You can be picking up mushrooms <laughs> because you seeded that with your spores. But that's like, it's soft and because of that, it's rigid somehow? Or? Well, it's got in, well. That's like framed up afterwards. But here, it's. I mean, the bales just sit on the ground. You just put a tarp over it, and that's it. Yeah, yeah. Like that's if you, if you try to slide the bale, if you try to slide the bale on the ground, it won't budge because there's yeah. too much attrition. Ah, yeah. Too much friction. So it, it it's it's a low cost too way friction, to do a yeah. Each bale costs you like five bucks or something. Um, I mean, that's cheaper than lumber, you but you're limited to height. Hmm? Where do you put the tarp? Just lay the bales, maybe tie a string around them so they don't, you know, even for more reinforcement, like tie a rope around the whole thing, just put a tarp right on it, and just make it fit the edges. You don't even have to fold the edges, they pretty much self-fold, because it's, it's a low thing, it's only like, you know, the size of a bale. You could probably do two bales and, and like put a spike through them, you know. Um, or do what they do here, but then you're, you know, even like one solid piece of wood around if, if the whole thing. If you scroll down, there's one there with two bales. Uh, Look at these no, guys. No, for the, uh, 
Uh, yeah, look at those guys. <laughs> you, got, you can get large bales. Now, they'll cost you a little more, but that's a, you know, that's a way to go. I mean, they will degrade over time, but... Um, right. a, I mean, if, if they're under the tarp, if there's a tarp under them, so they're not yeah, directly yeah. maybe I mean, in contact with the soil, and if there's a tarp over them, they'll last right. a little bit. Yeah, they'll last a few good years. Um, tarp, just wrap them around with tarps, so, and like... You know, don't get water in them. Uh, that definitely would work. You, you can definitely wrap the bale all around, and then you can put another tarp, another polyethylene, over the top, and that's. Uh, it's yeah. not. I mean, one it's advantage is it might have it's practical. Right, and one advantage it might have as a pond actually is that you get free insulation. I mean, the the walls are the insulation too already. Yeah. Yeah, and what is that? Hey, bales for a wildlife pond. Look at that. They, these guys went pretty larger scale. Um, but anyway, um, more more pond types. Tubs. Tubs are an effective way to go for, like, if you do rafts. So tubs. These are called con they're concrete mixing tubs. They're, you get them like five bucks or ten bucks, like these things. Mm. And that's that's really good for a raft system, and we do these for the perlite starts of the actual plants, so you can get. Um, I, I I post I posted a link for the the the, the wood ones. Into the dock, work dock. Uh, in in the chat there, oh, and there's also preformed pond ponds. I'll post a link for that too. Put it in the dock. Yeah. Oh, in the dock, okay. I don't know, do I have edit? Of course. Um, can you paste the link to the dock? Work dock is there. And a chat box. Okay. Um, preformed ponds and then you get expensive yeah. like concrete in ground tile I mean that that gets well the preformed are like they're not too expensive if they are um, small if you do if it's like really small a very low cost is also pond liner so like EPDM and a hole in the ground that will hold water so pond liner it could be Pond liner plus digging. I mean, that's how you do huge ponds, like pond, pond with pond liner. But pond liner, that's like 50 cents a square foot, so it's not that cheap. Um, well, like, you know, like they do this kind of stuff, you know, with pond liner. Yeah, like these things but how do you get a such a big big sheet that gets very very heavy or you have seams in it which uh, that looks like yeah they got a bunch of seams in that thing so that's a possible failure point but you can go without anything you can just dig a hole like the pond we have next to the sea eco home that fills completely up to the brim after a good rain and stays there for a, a month or two so it it doesn't really dry it, this year it hasn't dried up dried up yet so just a hole in in clay clay ground and sandy soil that wouldn't work but if you've got clay a lot of places have a lot of clay hole in clay soil so that's um we can go that's that's what we did here so um Pond. Let's see what we see for pond. Oh yeah, it's the boat adventure there. Uh -huh. Pond. This thing. That's what it looks like after a rain. That was right after digging it. And we were actually, that water hydrant there was actually connected. We were going to connect a pump in there to have like a backup water water store. 
but that's without liner and it stays there for quite a, like a few weeks it, you know a few weeks before a couple of weeks week after like two weeks let's say it starts lowing level you can dump bentonite clay like bentonite clay um, have you guys heard about that so that kind of seals up the pores in the ground so so how to do ponds with bentonite um, I mean Google it it's it's basically you, you dump I think all you do is like dump a few bags of the bentonite spread it all over and it kind of seals the pores in the ground they use that for well drilling as well so bentonite clay plus dig could do that <clears throat> and then like the above ground pool that kind of a technique where you have vertical posts and then like a linear uh, rail and that, that's like like they make above ground pools like above ground pool style that's a pretty decent way to go because you can do that say you got above ground pool style uh, that means you typically have a ring that self that's connects onto itself, so it can take a lot of force outwards, and it's got vertical posts to support it. So, right. if you click, I, I put a link on frame that would, I put a link on frame that would that shows various options for that style. So, I mean that that's aesthetic, quite aesthetic. And yeah, you can get your fish in there. So, but basically, what and if you, you keep scrolling down, you're gonna see the ones with posts, the ones with plywood, like old. The there's a variety. So this is what we want to learn from. But this, oh yeah, this is what we we can do, pretty much. Now you have to like if ours is gonna be long, so you want to probably support the middle so it doesn't bulge, bulge out. So how best to do this? <clears throat> Uh, any other pond types that come to mind? Um, then there's dams. <laughs> you can dam stuff up. Like dams are a whole other class for getting water. Uh, to make a frame. What about like steel tube welded? Yeah, that's gonna be. That will work. You still need all the space in between. Right. That's a definite strong structure. So how do we do it? So how do we optimize for minimal material, highest strength? So let's go to the next page. The cost will go up, but um, I mean, using uh, just you know basic uh, wood framing or or plywood with some, uh, yeah. some kind of thin duroc or something, you know, as a in a layer, and put some whatever you want. Yeah, so like um, so. Yeah, like let's actually duroc is a good thing because that lasts forever. So I like this kind of material just a uh, cement board like we're using for so how the typical price of this kind of a thing oh, how big is this thing three by six typically oh that's half inch so that's really heavy uh, three by six feet yeah that's really solid um, that's that's good that's for like 12 bucks for 18 square feet. It's pretty good. Um, that's for the front, right? Sides. So, for sides. example, if you... So, in a strategy like that, you can do this kind of material. Now, we do have a bunch of 2 by 12 lumber in the big pile. So, for mm -hmm. speed, I, I would suggest we just do that. Let's copy this little image into the in-ground pond thing. That's a hole in clay soil. Um, so fr let's do the framed option. I mean, we've got to do something real quick that's like, you know, you can do 
couple of few hours. Uh, let's just take, let's do this. Since we have the material on hand, um, whatever the length is, two by 12. That's looking from the top. a lot of work. It'll be a lot of lifting. But you, if it's stabilized, or if it's not stabilized, you, you put the tarp on it. If you want to finish the interior layer that's stucco, that's a lot more work there too. That's kind of getting into the in-ground concrete pool territory where you get to stucco it and it's a lot of, lot of work. But hey, that's it. So there, we fixed it. You can put screws through the ends uh, now, what I would do, on t like if you want to do minimum material for highest strength, if this is a quite long, which it is, so say we've got the greenhouse around it, how much walking space do we want? So we basically are determined by, here's our, our structure, of a square structure for the 16 by 16, so what do we do on the inside for, for best use of space, plus access to towers we want to get a growing bed in there we want to get growing towers um, we could consider a tote um, IBC tote or two or four or six or eight because that, that's how many would fit in the back if you wanted to do okay so actually let's go to the construction set of elements so now we have to look at when we do the pond that's a critical space taking aspect of the greenhouse so you gotta arrange it in a good way so let's look at the construction set elements of what all we want to put into this greenhouse and then we say okay we do the pond based on that so so these are some elements that we can talk about what we can definitely do so okay ponds growing towers gutters say for duckweed rain catchment biodigester plant beds Warm towers, warm beds, black soldier fly, algae tank, growing shelves, mushroom towers, ozonator tank, sand filter tank, uh, get, go crazy with macerating toilet in a 4x4 four four space, uh, if you want to integrate that in there. Controller and watering, seating trays, microgreens growing, fish breeding, wall roof door modules, worm har harvester, chicken module. Um, so how does this look like? Uh, this was a diagram of closed loop water, macerating toilet, uh, again into this closed loop water stuff. Um, but that's what a s system would look like if you wanted to do a closed loop nutrient cycle. Macerating toilet, warm towers or duckweed gutters if it's a separating toilet, which goes where? Uh, you figure that out. Duckweed gutters, growing towers. Warm towers can go into the biodigester. From biodigester, you could probably go back into towers or ponds, because uh, that's so you can go. You probably go from biodigester back to growing towers, because that's nutrient. And to ponds, from pond quality water. Yeah, growing towers, growing beds. To ponds, they all dr everything drains into ponds. So ponds are relatively clean. They support fish, so they got to be clean enough for that. Then you purify that with uh, ozonators and filters. I mean, there would have to be some filters there, uh, but you can actually reuse that water uh, definitely for your toilets. And, and if you put have enough ozonation, yeah, probably to potable. So filters, you have to add some filters. So that's just some closed loop nutrient cycle concepts. You can play with that and see like what would fit. Because I mean, we could do this kind of stuff and. You know all the elements we kind of we have, and we'll we'll build a few of those. So here's a so here's a basic design of uh, what we would have. Uh, so you got wall roof door modules. Uh, we definitely want to have the ponds. So this is just a diagram of the possible elements we could put in. Growing towers definitely. That's like the core of the food growing. 
what else do we have? We want to put in a plant bed. Yeah, it would be nice. Uh, warm towers, possibly. Growing shelves. We got some that are partially prepared. Uh, so we could do root crops like carrots and beets. Mushroom towers. Yeah, we, yeah, we stack buckets of one on top of another. But that's the growing tower, right? Not the same. Mushroom towers? Uh -huh. No, that will be five gallon buckets, five of them stacked on top of one another. Okay. Uh, ozonator tank, duckweed azola gutters, so gutters, if you want to put gutters on the on the wall. Worm beds, like if you want to treat all your compost in there. Biodigester, macerating toilet, rain catchment, algae tank, sand filter tank. Okay, so what do we do? Uh, that's some of the options. We definitely, in this design here, we definitely want to have, well, let's pick off some of those elements that we definitely want. Um, well, we definitely want these two. Uh, so the growing towers are going to be over the a row of like probably two rows of these. How much space do we need to get around this thing? I mean, we need to walk around it. We got to save save a little bit of space. So I would say we optimize for the largest pond because then you can have the most resilient system. It's the least susceptible. Like the less water you have, the more things can go wrong so the more you have it stabilizes and it's got more thermal mass so it gets colder or hotter slower things like that on that note uh, can grow more fish the normal you know evaporation um how long would it take you know for your pond so to speak um to meet you know more water filling and stuff like that uh, uh, what's the water loss per day here? Plants transpire. Depends. Depends how much how much you you're opening up the windows. But you do want to open that up, and it's like 100% humidity in there. So I would say you probably lose like five gallons a day or so, uh, just by transpiration. If you have a thousand plants, how much does a lettuce plant transpire per day? Well, I mean, can we find that? How how much does one lettuce Say you got a thousand lettuces in there. This was an experiment. Plan transpire. That's it emits water. Um, for for cooling, why why do plants emit water? They do. Um, I think. Don't they need for photosynthesis or something? That's just carbon dioxide. Perhaps. They take carbon dioxide and water, and they make carbohydrates. Accumulated water use, plant transpiration. So you've got milliliters per dry mass. Okay, dry mass is complicated because then you got probably like five ninety-five percent is not dry mass. Um, lettuce is like mostly water, uh, but if you're even just harvesting it, just by the weight of it, say you got a pound per month. That's like a thousand pounds of water, which is like a hundred gallons. So right there, you've got three gallons per day just in the mass that you're absorbing into those plants. So that would be one figure. Maybe that's what trans transpiration might be close to. Um, do plants give off water? Typical plant absorbs water from the soil. The water eventually is released to the atmosphere as vapor via the plant's stomata. That's, see, that's the thing. If a plant is turgid, <laughs> if it's not wilted, that means it's constantly transpiring water. That's what provides that pressure. So how much does a plant drink a day? Um, what are those figures? Not, not sure exactly, but you'll see that you'll need refilling of this. So that you can't just like leave this in the desert without a backup water source. You're going to have to have water catchment or a, a water source for this. Because, yeah, you'll see this go down like, I don't know, 5, 10, 15 gallons a day. Something like that. Uh, so you want this tank to be much, much more than that. 
like 100x. So you, so like say you lose 1% a day, you could still keep it alive for 100 days without having to refill it, something like that. Um, don't know the exact figures, but that would be in the data collection of, of all this this thing. Um, so, how much space do we leave around to? So let's let's determine how do we design the pond size? Because you want to be the biggest you can, because you can have the most fish and most resilience and most water storage and thermal stability. It'll just go up. It yeah, could you could you could do you could do that. So let's talk about both. How how far are we gonna? What's the optimal to take it up, and what's the optimal to leave it in terms of size, given that you want to do other things in this greenhouse too? So, I, I want to have a grow bed. I, I'd like to have a grow bed in there so we can do, so grow bed. Or maybe we say no, we do like shelves, like three sets of shelves or two sets of shelves that are deep. We actually have those actually pre built in our wood pile, uh, which we could use. So, a grow bed would be like four by eight for significant size uh, to get a lot of stuff on there. Grow bed like four by eight is a convenient size. That's what lumber comes in uh, or sheeting. Uh, one yeah. possible idea would be to, um, if you want to have grow beds and you want to take space inside the greenhouse, uh, Victorian greenhouses they would have cold frames outside. So basically, you put your grow bed outside and put a cold frame roof on it, and it still shares in a little bit of the heat from the the greenhouse or you can do this uh, straddle the grow bed across the pond because the fish don't mind but you're reducing space of the towers mm. uh, do we want two side access so you can block this off um, for convenience I would probably how many people leave. inside at the same time 50 I know, I mean, that just for the demo. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, if you, so oh, say, say you do a functional system like that, designed for a person or two being in it, but you got to be comfortable taking trays of stuff, like if you're harvesting, you can't be like all hitting everything when you, you got to have comfortable walking space, access, like if you're, you know, planting a load of stuff, enough for a cart, like a, maybe like a dolly, like a, whatever, because, uh, if you're harvesting and you're harvesting quite a b bit, you're going to have like big tubs or heavy weight in there. That's okay, so that's a cool thing. You can do that in front of the greenhouse too. That would be kind of getting outside the greenhouse there. Uh, that would work. What if you allow the vertical elements to move? Like put the pipes on a track so they can nice. move, be moved around. You can do that. that. That's. Yeah, that's more mechanics. <laughs> more mechanics, so it's more fun to play. But it's sort of yeah. heavy too, and they're heavy. Can yeah, you can. Those, uh, moisture capture systems they do in the desert, where it does like a, a to reclaim our water that's evaporating out. They have. That's uh, you can put a dehumidifier that that <laughs> that drains back into the pond, or you can do atmospheric water generators. Those are a little expensive, but yeah, they're good for potable water. Um, What's an atmospheric uh, uh, water generator? Oh, these the things. This is uh, these things exist and they're almost affordable. Well, go to smile.amazon.com and support open source ecology. dot org. No, uh, here. You hook up a power. Here's a. If you've got plenty of solar, atmospheric water generation is a non-issue anywhere, even in the desert. So, okay, this is not coming. So atmosphere. So in other words, like we got, we just got 50 kilowatts of power, PV, no water issues. So you can do the off-grid CD go home slash greenhouse. You're producing your water. I mean, okay, let's look. This is really cool. Look at this. You can also hook up the. I mean, all this stuff. It's like you can buy one that's. Uh, I mean, you can get this on Amazon, but this kind of a thing, which is just a device, it's like, well, okay, let's let's find one on. Um, it's a dehumidifier that that keeps the water clean. I mean, okay, this is uh, where 
uh, say Amazon. <clears throat> I mean, these things. They. Um, these are the units that. What do they, what do they call them? That's put the, uh, the hydrogen in the. Uh, no, that's not. That's not doing that. It's. Uh, no, that's not. Water. Yeah, I was also trying to figure out what, how, this, Air. how this is different. Because I've heard like a hydrolysis and like water condensed. But wait, if the humidity is not 100%, oh, does it mean that the plants are not It's, it's less efficient. No, so imagine you lower the humidity. What what changes in the plants? Do they transpire faster? Because no. That no, they just pretty much keep going. They just keep going. Okay. Um, what is this thing? But. Uh, you can get one of them for like a th well, the wiki's where you want to go. Uh, let's look at that. I've looked at this a bit. Um, Thirty liters per day, one thousand seven hundred fifty dollars. Seven gallons a day. It's pretty good. It's. it's it works. All you need is electricity, and not too much. Even it's uh, 450 watts. 250 watts per li per liter. Yeah, so it would be 350 watt hours per liter produced. You know that's significant, but it's not prohibitive if you've got ample energy, it's like solar energy. So and we do. We have cheap solar panels at 33 cents per watt. So if you have eight so. Eight hours of sun, you can have eight liters a Yeah. Or, or depending on how If you got good humidity, if you've yeah. got, if you're in the desert and it's 20% humidity, it might take you, you might get five times less mm. or something like that. But 350 watts, that's one solar panel that costs today $120 at sunelect.com. And last for 10 years. 20 right. years. 50 years. They're guaranteed for 20 years and they live for like 40 or 50. I mean, this is this is all real. This is like you can totally have an autonomous kind of a housing aquaponics system. That's why this is quite it is quite exciting. Uh, autonomous housing is quite real, and um, we'll see how far we can push that. How how fast? Um, and then you talk about water splitting, and then you get hydrogen. And that's that's energy resource. So your house could be producing. Your house is your, now your gas station. Like we have. Sorry, we have. Uh, Fossil fuel gas stations, the community gas station based on PV, that's a realistic thing. Uh, you do like a like a one acre parcel in the city, you get like, I was, one, was going through the numbers, you get like $300 worth of hydrogen per day. That's, that's a viable business. 300 bucks times 300 times 30 days, like per month, like $10,000 revenue from a hydrogen filling station, if that tech is open source. That's realistic. Off solar, that's not talking about fossil energy, like typically happens for brown hydrogen, which is dirty hydrogen, which is just made from fossil fuels. This is like <coughs> solar. Yeah, this How is real stuff. Hydrogen right now? How open source is it? Yeah. There's no good open source electrolyzer that I know of. There's a bunch of crappy ones you can get, but like a really high performance one that doesn't exist. So that's great work for open sourcing because that's like decentralizing a trillion dollar industry, which is fossil fuels. So that's all good. All pos a bunch of possibility. Are we a Mad Max tractor that runs on hydrogen? Yeah, but not yet. Not this year. We don't have it yet. You gotta keep us coming back. Yeah. Uh, that's probably <laughs> one or two years out. But yeah. Can you use this for aircraft? Of course. Uh, that's what rockets use. Rockets use hydrogen to go to space. Yeah, it's very energy dense if you compress it or liquefy it. Yep. Um, some houses have gardening rooms. <laughs> yeah. So you can like do the transportation of the little plants to the farm. Do you see this as being a workplace or just like a grow place? Work as in you is hang it out like there. Pre potting no, and uh, is it like you prepare to take the. You have to do it somewhere. So, right. so you yeah, you probably want to have like now? a prep table. Yeah. I do it. Um, did it in there. 
like a prep table. Yeah, like you want like a water faucet. Yeah. Things like that. Yeah, you, you do want buckets, something like that. So I don't know. They have, let me find one. Yeah. I mean, prep table. But, I mean, we're not going to do that right now. We'll just do it outside. We don't have enough space in there. Um, back to these dimensions here. Um, what do we want to do? Uh, I would say, like, I don't know, three feet around that. So we got space to walk around it. The limit would be four feet for like complete comp but not like I think three feet is probably good. You can easily get around that. It's a doorway. Doorway. Mm -hmm. it gets it's kinda tight. It's like going through a doorway. Um, but if we save that space to be three feet. So what do we got? We got ten foot ten foot pond. Because we got sixteen feet total. And it's really like nine feet because we got the walls, which are five and a half inches. So no, actually we we're, we've got full sixteen. So ten foot. So this comes out to be ten foot pond. So ten foot by how by how much? Um, we want if it's a grow bed, if it's four feet. Uh, you want, like, I mean, you'd really want three feet to walk around it for comfort. So, I mean, we can decide to make it, like, packed, unusable, or, like, super comfortable. It's, like, choices are ours for what we want to do. Um, so you can really pack it, and it's kind of hard to move around in there. Or you can do it more comfortably. Uh, but let's see what we have in each case. On that note, what was your rule of thumb for the space between the, uh, the, the towers? The orange, the uh, so, plant width. So, how big does a nice plant get? It's like this, so about that much. I mean, what is that, like 12 inches? Or what do we do in our greenhouse? Um, we have 20 towers over 30 feet. So, yeah, it's, I guess, 18 inches. 20 towers over 30 feet. Um, but that distance, like three, is comfortable walking. But if that is four against the wall, then you got seven feet right there. In the front, you want, what do you want in the front? Probably, let's just say nominally three in the front. So what do we end up with? Three plus three plus four. Ten. So we got six foot max for the, at this point we've got six feet for the, the pond, which is, that, that's actually perfect. That's what the pond and the CD go home one is, it's, I think it's six feet. Is that six feet, Katarina, there? Yes, it's six feet. Yeah, so six feet would be, a, that's a pretty nice size. Um, and then, who can calculate the volume of that if we go three feet up? Let's do like three feet, maybe, two or three feet. Probably like two or three uh, two by twelves. Just do that. Um, if, okay, so here's what I would do. I would do two by twelve. I would put a single two by four behind it to strong back it like do this so three of them are held together that's uh, a two by four and then on the ground it's gonna bust out at the bottom so what we want to do is put a board on the bottom and screw it with concrete anchors into the ground so the bottom doesn't pop out there's a lot the most forces at the bottom it's gonna want to pop out so uh, for that design you'd want to do a board maybe like an eight footer screwed down concrete anchors or concrete nails so it's just there it can be pu pushed out by all the force of the water at three feet high and three feet is that's very manageable like we could if we did this kind of system we could probably go higher uh, if we have the bottom stabilized 
all that force, yeah, we could catch it. And then um, what I would do also is uh, put a cross tie on top. So do a little uh, either a metal wire or a piece of rebar just across the top so this doesn't bulge out at the top. If you want this to, to last like forever and and be structurally sound. Just the rebar and then you have to put like a an ending to the rebar where you can screw the rebar like a, put an angle on the rebar or something like that and then just screw it in something like that. Uh, or just a rope like like a hook like an eye hook and metal rope something like that. Drill the, the wood and then pass it over? Well so if we have this reinforcement there we've got three inches of drill through um, and this board here that's just sitting on the ground on the bottom that would be like the easiest thing to get framed up that um, takes advantage of the concrete floor that we have because we have something solid to put the bottom boards into um, so 10 by 6 is what kind of what we're ending up with um, then we have enough room to walk around what do we do in the front? We can do, we should do a bunch of gutters. So, like gutters for duckweed or Zola. We got we got live duckweed coming in like today. Um, we can do that, and then you run the water through that into the back into the pond as a layer of nutrient absorption. So, for example, if you've got like 10, 10 gutters every like six inches, eight inches. That's a doable thing. Um, that gets you a, a lot of growing area for a plant like duckweed. You can go through things like duckweed calculations. Let's see, we've got some duckweed calculations. How much duckweed is required to process urine of one person? That would be a duckweed calculation. <laughs> If you integrate this as a uh, closed loop water system, duckweed is why duckweed and azola they grow really fast. Their numbers are like pretty crazy. They do. First of all, they're fish food. So, you, so if you're, if you send, you have a little hole that goes back into the tank. You're feeding your fish, and you're purifying your, your waste if you want to do that. Um, growth rate of duckweed per square meter. Five grams dry weight per day. It's a lot. It's a lot. Uh, there's more info. Um, so when you when you were growing a fish, did you try feeding the duckweed back into the fish? I uh, never got the gutters going, but when the duckweed was put in there, yeah, it got all eaten up because we, we we plant we, we seeded some duckweed in there too. It just gets eaten up by the <coughs> fish if it's directly in the tank. It'll just disappear. So you got to keep it elsewhere. I took, like I, I had I was doing the lap I took the duckweed. And maybe in the covers. Yeah. Maybe you dried it. Yeah, you dried it. Put it in the covers. Put it to a hammer meal in a covered meal. That's good. That's awesome. So, for example, <coughs> if you've got two, pe like, uh, you know, I was just looking at some numbers here. So, so if you got two people that weigh 300 pounds, fish mass is 300 pounds in your tanks. Assuming they produce similar amounts of protein or nitrogen, we would need eight square meters of azola to handle the nitrogen loading. So, how much do you get out of a wall of 16 footers? They're like five inch channels times 16 feet. Uh, you get like a meter, let's see. Oh, I actually did that already. Existing greenhouse 
has 20 square meters. That's for the 800 square foot greenhouse, so three of these. So one third has about seven square meters. So the size we have right now has enough area. If you, I forget how I was doing it. I think I was doing it all around, like if you just have vertical gutters. Um, and we need eight square meters. So if you put vertical gutters in the current greenhouse that we're building all around, you would have just about enough to handle nitrogen loading of two people. So you got your separating toilet and you actually can use Zola duckweed to purify all your all your urine waste if and turn it into fish food if that is going back into the ponds. So you're closing that material cycle there. That's pretty cool. Um, and you got to figure that out to make sure like we haven't self-feeding so that out of the bottom trough you would uh, leak out some of that duckweed but not all of it so it would be like a flow through system you might have to figure out how fast do I got to pump a water pump so that the Azola duckweed just maybe like you know five percent of it or ten percent leaves per day so you got you got those troughs constantly filled so there's some fine tuning there. That's that's the kind of R and D that needs to happen. And okay, here's a system that we work out, and then you can reliably do it according to certain parameters, like flow rates and things like that. So it'll be interesting to to get out of this kind of a system. Um, we could try some some gutters. We have some, um, but first thing is yeah. So the pond. Let's do like six by ten. Yeah, that makes sense. How many gallons do you have in there? So, um, let's say we do, so what you do is go online volume calculator and you say for your cube uh, or this rectangle length is um, 10 feet six. then uh, 6 by 3 calculate that 180 cubic feet two gallons how many gallons we got 1346 gallons that's the equivalent of five IBC totes that's pretty good so if we do that we got plenty of water there that would be a nice system for you can handle quite a bit of fish how many fish per gallon like um, how many tila how many trout per gallon of culture? So we can do trout. We can go to there's a trout stocking place an hour away per gallon. Wait, we're doing trout in the system? Mm-hmm. Oh, high quality, no more tilapia. This survived in the winter, but oh, okay. 20 to you, 40 yeah, it wouldn't die in the winter if you don't don't heat it. Can we do a lazy river trout situation? And just go swim with trout. There's a farming place 40 minutes away, so we can probably take a good there, yeah. Rule uh, one. One six inch fish for every hundred gallons of water. Okay, so that's pond culture. Rule two, one inch of fish per ten gallons of water. Pond. So that's ponds. That's not a per gallon of aquaponics. That's that's lower stocking density, not as an intense system. In a smaller size tank, we recommend stocking the tank with one inch of fish every one gallon of water, but it doesn't say how much when they're adult. That's just stocking density. The next question is, um, I think I heard like pound per gallon or something that's like low intensity. Uh, fish tank, stocking density, one pound of fish per five, seven, okay, no, it's actually... Stocking density, one pound of fish per five to seven gallons of tank water. Mm -hmm. Well, if that's the case, um, that's that's like general. Okay, so that's one source that says that. If it's that much, let's say it's one pound per, per five, got a thousand, so you could do up to like 200 pounds 
up to about 200 pounds of fish in that system. That's, yeah, that's quite a bit. It's a lot in that small area. And so that's that's how how long the duration of time. I would say. Well, you can be constantly harvesting that if you have different cycles. But I mean, for one fish to grow, it's however much it takes to to get to full size, which is like for tilapia, it's like a year or something, or maybe half a year to a year. How long does a trout take to to harvest? About nine months. Pan-sized ones take 12 to 13 months. Oh, huh. that's pretty good. So a year. So every year you're getting 200 kilos, 200 pounds, from that this one system, from this small system. Now, if you go, you can go. You know, you can start maxing this out, do taller, but then you're reducing your tape, your your volume of towers that you can handle, because the towers would here conveniently be located above. So you're dripping right into the, the pond. That's why you put the growing towers in there. Um, so the, let's say so you could do duckweed calculations here. And then so this one says we're gonna get um, like 200 pounds per year if we're just operating this man that's like half a pound per day that's like how much protein does a person need per day? Um, <clears throat> so fish yield, trout yield. Trout is needed north and tobacco is needed south. Yeah. So according to this estimate here, now that's you can do stocking density at at different amounts like <clears throat> because the growth rate depends on how much you're going to purify the water and how much you're going to aerate it get get oxygen in there so you can hyper oxygenate and that's intensive culture that's that's systems where you you got to make sure that your pumps are running hard all the time and your fish would die without a lot of excessive air injection. So, uh, but let's take a look at that intent, what intensive fish culture means. So when I see that 100 pounds or 200 pounds, I'm thinking a couple of those little air pumps like we, we have in the other greenhouse. But if you want to go nuts at it, and have a high, like super high productivity, you really have to pay attention. And I think the industry that what they do is actually do pure oxygen, not just air, but oxygen, because you need to do that. Um, artificial in artificial tanks in very high densities. So, yeah, I mean super high densities. So they got to keep the like have a lot of energy put into. Uh, that's kind of hard to read. Um, but what is that? What is stocking density of intensive fish culture? Now, would we want to get into that? That means like any power outages, you have to do more oversight. Like every day you have to monitor, probably have automated monitoring to look at your oxygen levels because you're really pushing the limit of that because you're pushing the limit of how much you're feeding them because they'll just eat if they have enough oxygen and, and and temperature and food they'll just keep eating so it's a mixture of 
how much your ox how much I guess probably how much you're feeding because the oxygen that you can only max it out so much before the water doesn't really take any more oxygen uh, so you, you'd control the feeding rate but you have to be on top of that exactly because if you overfeed it it's now you start getting toxic and your whole culture dies because it's so intensive but what are what what is possible intensive fish culture stocking rate the minimum recommended stocking density of a common carp is, is 80 fish per meter cubed intensive maximum 150 kilos per meter cubed that's for that even to say for beginners um, now intensive cage culture that would be the maximum oxygenation level so cage culture is where you have that exchange like all the waters exchange because they're just in cages in a much larger pond so you can like really pack it in there um, but here already they're saying for when we look up intensive they're already saying 150 kilograms per meter cubed we got five meters cubed and and your the water that flows through your system up there is about how long uh, we get full uh, rotation of the water well you've got pumps at like five gallons per minute each so like 10 gallons per minute um, and it's say it was 3,000 gallons in there so that's 300 minutes so that's five hour exchange time but that's just running through the tower so that's not getting all the nutrients out we that was without like any of the grow beds like yeah when we had the nuts in there we would have another pump and that was just ebb and flow but you can say like exchange a few times per day uh, that's not intensive that's that's not, but here, I mean, look at these numbers already. One, 300 pounds per meter cubed stocking density. We got five, 1,500 pounds per year in intensive culture. I mean, this stuff is just insanely nuts productive. It's just a matter of how much energy you're putting into the management of it. But this is once again, a case where like for post scarcity, yeah, you can get amazing productivity rates, um, but at that point it becomes a job. It's a management. You got to be very much on top of it. But that kind of so let's put a note on that. That's a good. This is good. Good. Good module to study. Here's your 16 by 16, uh, and we're saying max yield 1,500 pounds per year in intensive culture. I mean, it's insane. So that means every square inch of that has to be growing with plants. The plants have to be healthy, like uh, all of that. So that's like, that's where you get to. We don't even have the basic, the, the low and, you know, the very basic 200 pounds, which is already huge. We don't even have that as far as here's a commercial system that could do that, like a robust, resilient system. So first you get to that, then you can talk about, okay, now let's start optimizing and also start optimizing with ways that aren't just 100% mechanical, just pumps and, and feeders. It's, it's also biological, you know, like start optimizing for the other elements. So, so maybe you find that you might have like, a, like in the summer, you might have a bunch of towers, like a whole field of towers outside or something like that because there's so much nutrients because you're feeding the fish so much and getting them enough oxygen to live on. So, but that's, I mean, that... As I'm saying, those numbers are, are pretty real. Um, when we harvested, we did like, it was like about 120 pounds we harvested from the one pond that was alive. And that was like really not caring, not, not giving any management to this, like not even hardly feeding them. They're, they're just get, getting whatever. Sometimes, no, we, we give them some fish food, but a lot of it would be um, stuff that falls in there, like algae growth and worms that were in the towers and stuff like that or like the bugs that drown in there and stuff like that so uh, but yeah that's uh it's pretty interesting so yeah so if we been, build this little three foot pond that's what we're designing for <coughs> the basic the basic figure up there um yeah 
So let's build a build that build that thing. So let's let's get out there. Um, can I ask this a, uh, two quick questions before yeah. we do? Uh, is this, you know, uh, uh, another uh, consideration for different application? Um, yeah. Are we going to have uh, any kind of water filtration? I guess like. Well, that's the towers. No, it's like just the towers and embeds. So we have to make sure that whatever we put in there is actually filtering the the water. So if we put like twenty towers in there, that's enough for that. Well, so I guess I'm thinking like, uh, for instance, um, I know you, like you said, the, the seaweed, the you know, fish pool, all that stuff got caught up in there. So one way of dealing with that was uh, just use wider, yeah. um, you know, uh, yep. openings. Yeah. Um, is there any advantage for ever using uh, an actual, you know, filtration system between the pond and the, um, the towers and the grow beds and things like that? Because I guess I'm thinking if, you know, if you ever wanted to play around with, you know, different kind of fish or plants, kelp, anything like, you know, that may have different nutrient requirements or something that you don't necessarily want enough. Yeah, yeah. I mean, sure, it depends <laughs> what you want to do. If you have some something, like, for example, if you're in, in hydroponics, you definitely want filters. Uh, I mean, say you're doing foliar spraying. Okay, so say you want to do foliar feeding in this greenhouse. You absolutely have to have a, a filter in front of that because misting goes through very small nozzles. So it, it just yeah. depends what you're doing, what exactly you're doing in there. Okay. So, but if you, our goal is we've got all these nutrients, we want zero labor, yeah. So we just feed it all to the plants and they handle it. The plants and worms handle it. And minimal <laughs> minimal stuff like the filters you're going to have to maintain. Understood, yeah. So, uh, I, yeah. Um, and then uh, lastly, for, um, you know, heating the, uh, the water, if you did do an in-ground pond. Yeah. Um, how realistic um, is it to, like, tap geothermal, you know, heat underneath the... It's very realistic. You have to have the tubing to bury underground and a heat pump to to extract that heat. But that's that's doable. Uh, and those heat pumps, we haven't done uh, like ground source heat pumps. What we do do is like in this house is the air source heat pump. That's a heat pump we have in the house which cools and heats. So um, if you want to do in ground, that's that's like that's excavation and a lot of pipes in the ground but that's a very effective system that is a very good system because you got that 60 degrees year round which you ex extract with your heat pump and you get a good like a three times or so uh, amplification of the amount of energy you put into how much heat you get out if you're using electricity mm -hmm. so energy efficiency. yeah it's not like a resistive heater like on a stove top where you get one to one, like the amount of heat is what's in the electricity. The, with the heat pumps, you're multiplying a factor of three or so for the amount of heat that you get. Yeah. Thank you. Ken? Slide number nine. Yeah. Ah. Uh -huh. Look at that. Sweet. Wow, Look at that. Bamboo and tarps. Is this yours? Yeah, it's Ken's. This is yours? What kind of fish was it? Catfish and Okay, so I'm starting to record. Starting to record. The setup is complete. The system. They will, will build up in the growth week. What's complete? Um, the setup is complete. Now all we need to do is get the fish and put the fish in the system the wastewater from the fish and purify it and then we pump it back to the yeah. fish tank from the sun yeah i mean these totes totes are a good way to go for the tanks too i mean 250 gallons uh you have some plumbing there but 
<laughs> Very nice. Okay, so next. Um, maybe we have a team divvy up to glazing on the panels. Uh, we gotta clean off the glazing and attach it with the battens. That's one job. And behind the house, existing house, clean off that area 16 by 16 to just start mounting them. Or we can just go nuts right now and start mount the six foot ones. You can put them right on there. You can put them in place. So. Do we need, sorry, but do we need to square the the foundation? Yeah. <laughs> Not really, no. Yeah. You have two edges you can start right away. And then, um, my theory on that is if we don't, they're still movable. Yeah. Just put them up and move them to a square. Yeah. Because you have two. You already have two straight edges. So then you need to figure out where the corner ends up. It has to end up. If it's a straight line, it has to end up at the right place, since we're using uh, four. Yeah. They're still movable. They're light enough that we can still like bump them around. I, I would just do that. You can square it. I mean. Yeah, we can do a whole not, row and then just take guys this deal. one end and, and yeah, make just, it connect. Maybe just, just kick it with string. a hammer. Just yeah. a string. And then, then you can do a string, yeah, to keep it straight. But you'll see it visually. I mean, four of them is this is a much smaller structure, so. It'll be easy to just kind of like bump back and forth, mm -hmm. yeah. Because I mean, you'll you'll be determined. Okay, these corners have to end up at a point. They'll be determined. So you all you need to do is straighten out the wall if you need to. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, but yeah, we could. I mean, the six foot mm -hmm. modules, and eight foot. I mean, uh, since all of them are getting attached to the six foot. Well, the six foot are very easy to reach, uh, when in installed. So maybe do one team starting to clean off the side and install it install them and um, another team uh, we can have it at the same time there's glazing that's available that we can be attaching that so another team can do that and a third team grab the the remaining panels from the site um, or maybe do that right after lunch because I think yeah let's put a bunch of them up already get a feeling of uh, some accomplishment mm -hmm. and then we can get into uh, do this pond thing. That's that's basically picking a bu bunch of the two by twelves from the back storage, cut those to ten and six, and there we go. Uh, we can do just exactly ten and six. We don't have to worry about like six minus three inches. That's I think that's okay. There. Uh, so we have a solid wall, and that's that should be good. There's that two by four that just bonds them together, or two by six or two by four. There's one on the bottom that's anchored in, so we're going to drill through, drill with a drill, and put in like a couple of anchors. The, the Simpson strong tie uh, concrete anchors. Like, put in a couple, two or three. Um, we'll see how strong one of them is, but yeah, three. One, one end, one, two ends, and one in the middle for an eight-footer. That should, that should do the structure. Uh, for for these edges here, screwing a bunch of like four screws per corner, I think that should be pretty good. Um, if we see any weakness on that, uh, we can fix it. Um, yeah, yeah, and then put in um, put in polyethylene. So that's that's the cunning plan. Uh, should we s spend a little bit of time just to say who, who does what, or? Yeah, yeah, we should. We should. Who's doing the first thing? Who's taking the first panel and installing it on a corner? What's the three jobs, anyway? The three things? Um, the panels and what else? Post up the panels, mm -hmm. attach the, Top the glazing. All right. Top plates, we can get the, all the two footers. Stop, yeah, yeah, sure. Well, the top plate goes after. Glazing first on the panels. Right. You can stand them up at the same time as other team is attaching them. Because once they're standing, it's just as easy to attach them as well. It's the same thing. So those two can be absolutely parallel. So let's do that. Let's, let's put on the, the glazing and, and standing up the panels at the same time. We've got three-inch screws. 
Kurt is on which which team? We want to stand in the panel, uh, the panel that we put the ladies on. So there's two tasks mm -hmm. that you just let's let's do like super granular. So who's installing the first panel? Which is so we've got the hat the, the greenhouse like this, panel one, two. Like the corner. Let's stand up that corner since it's a defined corner. Yeah. As long as I know where it goes, I'll try. <laughs> Let's call that, we're going to go 1 to 16. So we'll go, the typical order is looking from the outside, we're moving to the right. So we're going to go around, start at the corner. So that's going to be panel 1 at the corner. Yeah, Who's got that. panel 1? Richard? Yeah, I'll, I'll go for it as long as, as, long as one. people make sure I don't put it in the wrong place. That's all. <laughs> Got you. How do you spell your name again? R A S H A R D. <coughs> okay, Rashard. Who's got the panel 16 right next to Rashard? Um, I guess I'll take 16, but I know it's going to be all names with my name, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sixteen. So we just put numbers. One through sixteen. Um, who's going to take one panel and put a piece of glazing on it? One six footer, which is going to be that. Well, let's say five. So it's out of the way still, because people can be there. There could be like as soon as one is done, number two can go up, right? So let's do the person. Well, let's take panel five. Who's going to attach glazing to panel five? It's a specific task. So are one through four, are they going to have glazing on them? When we put them up there, they're going to have glazing on it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so now, so now what we're saying is like, when I do 16, the glazing is going to be on it already? No, it's not on there yet. We, we're, okay. we're getting specific. So. Uh, it's either one or the other. You can't do two. That, I think we get messed up all the time where we say, oh yeah, just put the panels up and it's like put two or three tasks in there and people don't know what to do. So let's do like one task, okay. a granular task. Put that panel up so you know the pan where the panel is. Right. You can stand it up like in five minutes mm -hmm. and then we'll attach it. How do we attach it? Take the, start with the, the screws, the, not the screws, the... Battle strips? Um, no, we, we can do the nails, the concrete nails. We probably want to put in, like, let's see, we just need to stand it up and pretty much attach these two at the top. That's the most important thing. As far as a nail or two, yes, put in like a, take a hammer, put in two nails, like the concrete nails mm -hmm. at the bottom. But the thing is about those nails, they don't hold too well, so they might just prevent. They can come up easily, but they can keep you, it depends how straight it is there, but they keep you from shifting off the foundation at least. Once you put the second one on, uh, let the panels, so let's do this theory here, let the panels determine the level. In other words, don't follow the floor, like if the floor is going to be staggered down a little bit, don't follow that, just keep them even. And then we'll put the shims, shims underneath them as we need to, or a piece of pebble, or a thin strip of wood, whatever. Uh, do that, because the structure is light enough that I think we can do that, and still uh, keep everything straight at the end, because it's light enough. Okay, Penny, 16. Curtis, specifically. No, that this was uh, Eric. Uh, panel five. Just stand it. Uh, it's got no glaze. No, you can't stand it. Eric, glazing. glazing. Sorry. Yep. Glazing. Uh, who's got six glazing? Okay. So are they are the uh, the the glazed panels being put on with um, the liquid nail stuff again, or is it no screwing in through the battens? So so we talked about that battens screws. Um, use the pre-existing holes in the battens. Clean off the battens a little bit. Maybe take uh, one of those putty knives 
Uh, just clean them off a little bit. There's some, um, I think, liquid nails on it remaining. Uh, yeah, that needs mechanical attachment with the, the deck screws, the two and a half inch deck screws. Do we know where to find them? We got a bucket of those. We have, uh, yeah, two and a half. Or yeah, <coughs> we've got buckets that we took from the. Uh, we have the ones we we took off in the disassembly of the house. So uh, let's just take those. Take those. Uh, we didn't really count up the number of screws, but uh, can take a picture. Have a digital count. All right. Uh, Panel number seven, glazing. Who wants to do more? I mean, all the front. Uh, so here, five. Six, seven, eight is glazing. Um, and then by that time, what's probably going to happen is these walls are going to get filled in on the front and back without glazing. So who's got uh, Penny? Penny, just keep going to this side until we get to the corner, at which point these can actually get installed. We can stand up. These are getting glazed here because we don't know exactly where that point is. So until we get, uh, let the panels decide the spacing for us, uh, we can't stand those up there yet. And then the ones that we're glazing first are the six foot panels? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, six foot from the front. But all of them are six front at the front and sides. The back is eight. Right. Just the back is eight. Um, so, uh, who's eight? Eight for the glazing. I was going to say for the taller panels, um, if there's um, no one, or I don't mind helping for the panels in the back glazing. What do you got? Eight glazing. And management. Are we going to do some more before lunch, or are we going to go right to lunch? Well, no, let's, let's do it. Now. Let's start it. Let's we got 40 it. minutes. Yeah. There's more glazing. Um, well, let's see. Um, Curtis, so what, what are you end up taking? So you're going to do like... It's do like, do like, I know, so, so 13, do panel number 13, that's on the corner there, that's the 8 foot, 8 foot glazing. 13 glazing. 13 glazing. Who's got 14 glazing? Ken. So, 14. What am I doing? Panel. No, that's Richard. Oh, okay. Panel. Okay. Glazing eight foot. Uh, and then we've got some on the right hand side. Who's um, glazing of the more six footers? So that's going to be who's left still. Um. Whoa. So that's number nine. Uh, all 16 and then including the, <coughs> the long yeah. oh yeah so who's gla glazing the roof panels let's do put one glazed roof panel um, eight. Right. Put, put me, put me. We, we didn't do it all together everybody. Yeah, I have to say, is it, yeah, is it a way that you could do a little bit of yeah. you know, each task so you just get familiar with the process or help it at the very least Christian, you got 
18, which is the second roof panel. And and I'm going to take these cards out there. I'm going to crack down on anyone not doing that task. <laughs> <laughs> we got everybody? We got everybody. So that means first, if you're glazing, make sure you identify your material. If it's, the panels here are cleaned like by the water hose there. There's ones on the solar panels. There's like three or four there. Uh, those are available too. So Do they have the numbers on them? They don't have any numbers. They're either 6, 8, or 6, 14 feet, or 2 feet. Now the 8 foot panels, yeah. Um, yeah, there should be panels that are 6, 8, and 14. And then there's 2. So how heavy is it? Light. Super light. It's just, just plastic, yeah. Uh, just a... Uh, okay. Um, put it... Yeah. Can I, can I show you how this would work as an alternative to doing this maybe in the future?